I think we're going to get started and people will continue to join us as, as we progress. So first of all, uh, hello to everybody. Hi, everyone joining us in the US, Israel, Palestine, other places in the world. Thank you for joining us. Uh, what is uh, an incredibly tumultuous time, to say the least. And welcome to the latest in Partners for Progressive Israel's webinar series, Conversations with Israel and Palestine. My name is Maytel Kowalski, and I'm Partners for Progressive Israel's incoming executive director. Uh, before I hand it over to today's panel, just a little bit about Partners for Progressive Israel for those of you who are joining us for the first time today. We are an American not-for-profit dedicated to the achievement of a durable and just peace between Israel and its neighbors, which includes an end to Israel's occupation. Partners supports Israelis working to ensure social justice, civil rights, Jewish-Arab partnership, and equality for all of Israel's inhabitants. The organization wishes to deepen Americans' understanding of Israel's and Palestine's complexities so that they can better advocate for a progressive future for all the inhabitants of the region. We are extremely glad to be bringing this webinar to you today for free. Uh, we have a lot of people signed up and we really appreciate you joining us. We do try to do programming like this at least once a month, but oftentimes more. And the best way to ensure that we can continue to do so is through your contribution, which you can make at progressiveisrael.org. I'm gonna quickly introduce our incredible panel today, and then I'm gonna go right over to them because we have a lot to talk about. But I want to thank them for joining us. We have Dr. Eli Saltzman, who's the director of, of Gildenhorn Institute for Israel Study at the University of Maryland College Park and a board member of Meet Veeam, the Israeli Institute for Regional Foreign Policies. His scholarship and teaching focuses on international security, Israeli foreign and security policy, US foreign policy, and political psychology. Also joining us is Hillel Schenker, who's the co-editor of the Palestine Israel Journal. He's a former editor of the Israeli Peace Monthly New Outlook, founded in the spirit of Martin Buber's philosophy of dialogue and has written for The Guardian, The Nation, Los Angeles Times, LA Weekly, Dekun, Israel Horizons, In These Times, and the Israeli Press. He was involved in the founding of the Peace Now movement in 1978, and he served for many years as spokesperson for the Israeli branch of international physicians for the prevention of nuclear war, and is an international advisory board member of the Global Majority Center for Nonviolent Conflict Resolution. And last but definitely not least is our moderator, and I'm going to pass it over to her right away, which is Susie Becher, who is the managing editor of the Palestine Israel Journal. She is communications director of the Policy Working Group, a team of senior academics, former diplomats, human rights defenders, and media experts who advocate for an end to the occupation and a resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict based on a two-state solution. I'm going to remove my spotlight here so that you can see us all, and I'm going to pass it over to you, Susie, to get us started. Thank you. Thanks very much, Meital. Thanks to our panelists, and thanks to all of you who are joining us today. Before we begin talking about what lies ahead as the war enters its second month, I want to set the scene by talking about my personal experience of October 7th, because I think that it's really important that people get a sense of the trauma that was experienced here. Uh, I should mention that I've been in two Zoom meetings that were interrupted by sirens going off, and I know the same thing has happened to Hillel. So if we suddenly disappear from your screens, I'll leave it to, we'd like to keep your intention until we come back. It's usually five to 10 minutes unless the sky has fallen on us. Uh, as many of you know, degrees of separation in Israel don't even add up to six. Everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows you. So everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who was a victim of the October 7th attacks in some way or another. And frankly, we're a nation suffering from PTSD. I live in central Israel. And when the sirens went off that Saturday morning, I was sure it must be a mistake. Uh, the routine here is that there's always some kind of build up before an incident like that, usually something involving some major IDF action that's unlikely to pass without retaliation from Gaza. And almost always the first round of rockets is aimed at Southern Israel. Also, when, whenever anything really big happens here, the TV stations immediately start broadcasting. So we turn on the TV and there was some nature program. 
and then we turned on the radio and there was music playing. Uh, now, a lot of people have been drawing 9-11 analogies. And for myself, I remember watching television when the second plane hit the second tower. And there was a CNN correspondent standing there who blurted out that something must have gone wrong with the air traffic control system. And that was my first thought on October 7th, that something must have gone wrong with the air defense system. But we're good citizens. We didn't take any chances. We went down to the shelter. And when we came out 10 minutes later, the news was everywhere that missiles had been fired from Gaza and that some kind of fighting was taking place in the South. And then little by little, over the course of hours and even days, the picture slowly began to emerge. Now we're still learning new details and we'll probably learn even more when the Blessed Commission of Inquiry starts meeting. But on that day, we had to piece things together by ourselves. So we heard that some Hamas terrorists had broken through the fence. And then on TV, we saw this surrealistic picture of terrorists in two pickup trucks on the streets of Steyrot. And we figured that some squad had infiltrated State Road. Uh, it was a little shocking, but no great cause for alarm. And then some correspondents said something about fighting going on at one of the kibbutzim. And an hour later, they said three kibbutzim. And then in the evening, they said 20 locations, including army bases that had been overrun. And the next day, the fighting was still going on, and the day after that as well. We heard that dozens were dead, and we couldn't believe it, never even imagining that that was actually a low estimate. And then we heard something about hostages. So we pictured that a couple of people were being held in some apartment building somewhere uh, until we found ourselves watching live, unimaginable footage of people being dragged across the border screaming for help. And then the phone calls from people hiding in safe rooms started coming into the TV stations. Women whispering that there are terrorists in the house and begging the TV anchors to use their phones to get through to the GPS and find their location and let the army know where they were. Journalists started breaking into tears while broadcasting. And today I understand yesterday was the 30th anniversary and the correspondence, there was a special program in which the correspondents talked about what they were hearing that day that they didn't actually report because they didn't feel that they had authorization to deliver this news yet, but they were actually crying while they were broadcasting. And then reports came in that people who were able to get through to emergency numbers we're told that there's nothing to do but pray. Imagine yourselves calling 9-11 and the person who answers you tells you to pray. And all of this was before we even got wind of the slaughter, the brutality, the hair-raising stories of torture that simply defy comprehension. So we're a nation that feels betrayed. We feel vulnerable. Today, we feel pretty confident about the short term, but are very apprehensive about our children's future. And we feel very angry. We're angry at the intelligence failure. We're angry at the operational failure but mostly we're angry at a prime minister who refuses to take responsibility and a government that continues to mismanage everything. On the other hand, 
little bright note, the military commanders seem to be on top of things again. And we've seen unbelievable solidarity from civil society, which stepped up to fill the vacuum left by our leadership. So to the question, am I my brother's keeper? The Israeli people answered with a resounding yes. So having managed to end on a positive note, I'm now going to turn to our panelists who hopefully won't be delivering too gloomy a message. And I'm gonna start with you, Hillel. Uh, before we start talking about the day after, I'd like to hear when you think that day will come. We hear talks about weeks, months, a year. Um, do you think the Israeli government is clear about its objectives? Are they attainable objectives? And just to make things a little more difficult for you, I'd also like to hear whether you think the Israeli government is united in its objectives. So over to you. Okay, well, okay. First of all, the Israeli government right now has no clear objective. The only thing that we know is that they are saying, we want to destroy Hamas and we want to, as long as it will have to take, we will continue fighting. They have no exit plan. They have no future plan for what will be afterwards. And uh, this is, uh, as you mentioned, there's a sense of tremendous uh, systematic failure on, on the side of the uh, government and particularly on the side of uh, Netanyahu. Um, I happen to bring with me every weekend, uh, Mariv has a poll. It's been having a, a poll of what would be if there were elections now. Uh, in the period of the mass protest movement, the pro-democracy movement, already Netanyahu and his extreme white coalition had become a clear minority, only getting about 54, 55 seats, and the opposition was getting 65 seats. The latest poll said that uh, the opposition would get 68 seats, and that doesn't count the 10 additional seats of the three Arab parties. In other words, we're talking about 78 seats compared to 42 seats for uh, the right-wing coalition. And we also have uh, the uh, Gansas party, National Unity, getting 39 seats compared to uh, Likud's 18, 18 seats. Uh, and uh, because one of the things that I think you may have mentioned already is that um, Everybody in the intelligence and the army all have said, we bear responsibility for the failures of what happened on October 7th. The only person who has not taken any responsibility is Netanyahu. He refuses. Uh, he even, there was a moment where he sent out a uh, uh, tweet, where I don't know, now it's called an X, I guess, uh, in which he, he blamed the Mossad, the, the army, the intelligence, not himself, even, you know, everybody, the mainstream uh, uh, commentators on TV, uh, there was a huge uproar, anger against Netanyahu when it came to that, and he quickly withdrew uh, the tweet. And uh, uh, I think the most notable thing is the fact that um, Yesterday, Yisrael Hayom, the paper that Sheldon Adelson founded in order to undermine Olmert and promote Netanyahu, called for his resignation as soon as the war is over. So we're in a situation where there is a tremendous amount of anger against uh, Netanyahu and a, a sense that the government simply uh, isn't, you know, you, you said that uh, the answer that came when people called was pray. Well, the fact is that almost all of the government ministries 
are simply not functioning. And it's civil society which has come in and filled the gap. Uh, and the primary element within civil society, this is very important to uh, mention, is uh, the organizers of the mass protest movement. Uh, they quickly, they had a tremendous amount of organizational experience and infrastructure in place, organizing hundreds of thousands of people every week for 40 weeks. And they simply redirected their energies to helping the now 200,000 Israelis who are not in their homes, 100,000 from uh, the south, uh, the kibbutzim that were overrun, and Sferot, and Ofakim, and another 100,000 who were evacuated from northern communities, kibbutzim and Kiryat Shmona, in case of the possibility of a second front, a northern front, which meanwhile uh, has not happened and hopefully will not happen. So uh, I guess I'll stop there, or do you want me to continue? <laughs> That's okay. We'll uh, go to uh, Eli. Um, let's see here. All right, Eli, getting down to the nitty gritty, uh, what do you see as the possible scenarios for governance of Gaza after the war ends, both short term and long term? Uh, we know that a new one came up yesterday when all of a sudden Netanyahu kind of changed his tune and said that Israel will continue to control Gaza after the war. And uh, Blinken quickly told him to forget about that, but I wouldn't put it past Netanyahu to be planning to withdraw the troops, but put an even tighter siege on Gaza than there was before. So we'd appreciate if you could give us a survey of the various day after options that are being kicked around and let us know which one you think is the most likely. Oh, thank you so much, Susie. This is very kind of you, and I, I appreciate your uh, opening remarks. A, they were extremely uh, heartfelt, and I, I really, really appreciate that. Um, very emotional about that, to be honest. Um, well, indeed, you said uh, yourself, Susie, uh, the prime minister had it was interviewed by ABC's David Muir just the other day, and he presented this new approach, according to which uh, the Israeli defense forces will maintain, at least uh, in the near term, uh, a security presence or security control, um, meaning that they are not going to go in, do whatever they need, and then withdraw uh, beyond the border of the Gaza Strip. Um, there's a, it's kind of, it connects between the security, if you like, or the defense logic and the, the political one. The Minister of Education came out earlier today saying that he doesn't um, doesn't overrule the possibility of reinstating or rebuilding some of the settlements in the Gaza Strip. So it seems that there's a there's some there's some gaps there, but uh, um, it seems that uh, the international community in general and the United States in particular will have a say in that and how the the future looks uh, for the Gaza Strip. It seems like the Secretary of State Anthony Blinken just uh, just a few hours ago said that uh, he does not approve or does not see. Uh, favorably, this op this option or this possibility of an Israeli reoccupation of the of the Gaza Strip. Um, I think that um, Benjamin Netanyahu is in a bind here. Um, there's a political side to it that Hillel mentioned and described um, very well, in my view. Um, there's a failure there. This is traumatic. This is kind of the, the 1973 trauma um, on steroids, if you wish, given the nature of the of the attack of October 7th, given the fact that it was in Israel proper, um, the kind of the videos that came out, the body cameras of Hamas terrorists and so on and so forth. Um, so there's a political dimension to that, certainly. Uh, but there's a there's a kind of a military logic or the lack thereof, if you wish, nevertheless, that we need to kind of address. Um, and it relates to the, the, the operational feasibility of going into the Gaza Strip. And according to the government's decision, um, this operation is about uprooting Hamas and um, reinstating peace and security uh, for the Gaza envelope, those areas around uh, the Gaza from the Israeli side, obviously. 
So there's a question whether this is feasible or not. Um, the Israelis have carved the, the Gaza Strip into two. Uh, they're trying to move closer to Gaza City, where, um, according to most reports or some of the, uh, the intelligence reports, uh, the headquarters of Hamas are located. Some of them are under Shifa Hospital in Gaza itself, and some of it in tunnels underneath other uh, major locations, schools, and so on and so forth. So I think there's an angle there that the Israelis will find difficult as the number of casualties will increase inevitably given the urban setting and the need to engage in urban warfare that even uh, David Petraeus uh, kind of warned against a couple of days ago, saying that you know he fought both in Afghanistan and Iraq, and he said the Gaza Strip is a completely different challenge, and he would strongly encourage the Israelis not to try and do whatever the Americans were trying to do. It obviously failed long-term um, to a large extent. Um, I think that um, the, the rubber meets the road, so to speak, between the political, the international political angle and the military uh, operational aspect, um, given the fact that the United States is heavily involved in kind of running the show from behind, not only in terms of supplying military aid, but also saying what is, what is appropriate and what is not. And it seems like the, the Americans now, I saw a report just a couple of hours ago saying that there's some, there were some communications between the Biden administration or Biden himself um, and the prime minister to say, we need a humanitarian pause, for example, and there needs to be a curbing down or real kind of slightly reducing the, the attacks that ended up in a massive number of, of civilian casualties, according to the, uh, the Palestinian Ministry of Health that is controlled by Hamas. But nevertheless, you're talking about 10,000 people dead and, and several thousands more injured, in addition to those who were displaced from the northern part of the Gaza Strip to the south. Um, and again, I think that this is something that the Israelis are unable to override or kind of completely ignore in the long run. Uh, the pressure will amount, it, it, it increases on an hourly basis, not even a daily basis, given the fact that things are changing on the ground quite quickly. Uh, but eventually the Americans will put the, will put the, uh, the brake, will kind of press the brake and, and force Israel into that. So what's the next, what's the next possibility? What's the future? looking like? Well, Anthony Blinken, and I, as I said, they have a significant part of that says that Hamas cannot stay as such um, as powerful as it was so far. So from a governance perspective, I think that uh, both the consensus in Israel and across the pond in the United States, as well as elsewhere in the um, in Europe, for example, is that Hamas will need to be removed from the political scene. So there might be some kind of reconstruction, both political and physical. Um, even members of um, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's party, Likud party, kind of commented or kind of hinted about the possibility, believe it or not, of having the Palestinian Authority reintroduced into the Gaza Strip. Um, this is difficult and complicated for a variety of reasons, one of which is the fact that the Palestinian Authority, I don't think that they really want to be kind of um, entering the Gaza Strip on, on the bayonets of the Israeli forces that become very complicated. And to what extent do you are you able to fully disarm and remove Hamas? Some are talking about a 1982 First Lebanon War model in which a ceasefire, a complete ceasefire, or kind of something that is more long-term is predicated on or contingent on the removal of the leadership of Hamas. Uh, at the time it was uh, um, uh, Tunis, so this will have to be somewhere else, perhaps Qatar, somewhere in Lebanon where some of the leaders are already there, but what does it mean practically on the ground? Um, it seems like there's, um, there's an inclination at least that from the Israeli public, uh, I saw some, some public opinion polls saying that uh, some, some uh, major chunks, more than 30%, nearly 40%, either favor Israeli effective military control of the Gaza Strip for the foreseeable future, or some of them also support about 40% um, also support an international or multinational force, as long as it's mostly um, uh, kind of consistent of uh, Western, Western European and North, North American actors, Canada, the United States and Western Europe, European Union. But it seems like this is still not settled yet. It depends on what will happen in the next coming days, whether they're able to achieve their uh, tactical or strategic goals now in the Gaza Strip, whatever they are, and, and Hila was absolutely right in terms of the fuzziness, because when Biden was, was in Israel a couple of weeks ago, he literally asked 
is counterparts, including the prime minister. What's your exit strategy? What's the off ramp like? What would you consider as a victory? And it seems like the Israelis didn't have a very kind of coherent, um, tangible uh, answer. I don't think they have a better answer now, other than just you know the slogan of removing Hamas and reinstating safety and security of the settlements of the kibbutzim in the envelope, including the small towns in Sderot and Ofakim. If I may uh, briefly follow up, in the back of everybody, all Israelis' minds is what Eli mentioned, the first Lebanon war, when Sharon declared, uh, we're going in for between 24 and 48 hours, and they ended up staying for 18 years. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, what is happening uh, today is that uh, uh, Defense Minister Yoav Gallant is actually the most hawkish member of the decision-making group right now in the, the, the cabinet. And he is saying, as long as it, whatever it takes, as long as it takes, it can be months, it can be years, et cetera, the Israeli economy can't possibly bear months, much less years. And uh, we have a situation today where something like 350,000 uh, people are mobilized. That means they're all out of the economy. This cannot continue. This will have to end sooner rather than later. And uh, if you, I actually have a, a proposal, a suggestion that I'd like to raise, which this Israeli government would not be ready to propose. But what I suggest is that, first of all, I think there is a necessity for a ceasefire mm -hmm. as soon as possible under certain conditions. First of all, too many Palestinians and also now Israelis are continuing to be killed. And so we need a ceasefire, but we can't just have an unconditional ceasefire. It has to be tied with a number of things. One is what Eli mentioned, that there is a general consensus in Israel and also I think uh, with the American administration uh, and the EU that Hamas cannot continue to be in control of Gaza. And just as it was arranged for Arafat and uh, the yellow fighters to go to Tunis, it would be possible to arrange for the Hamas leadership to go to Qatar or perhaps to Turkey. Uh, that would be part of the arrangement. The other factor, there are two other factors. One is we haven't mentioned yet the 240 Israeli hostages. And yeah, the get Israeli <laughs> general public, that is the first thing on people's minds. And that is the what they're saying should be the first priority. And unfortunately, the government is not saying that. So we have the issue of the hostages. And there is a proposal of all for all. All means that uh, Hamas would release all of the 240 hostages in exchange for all of the Palestinian prisoners that Israel currently holds. That would be another component. And the third component is the introduction of an international, we, we all agree that at this point, uh, the Palestinian Authority does not have the credibility and would not want, as Eli said, to come in on the bayonets of uh, the Israeli army. Therefore, you need some sort of an interim arrangement, which would be, uh, Martin Indyk is talking about a trustee trusteeship idea, international trusteeship. We have elements of UN, United States, the Arab League, Egypt, which actually, which did run Gaza for, uh, how, what was it, 19 years. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. the, all of this would be a package deal that the Israeli government will not propose. The mm -hmm. candidate to propose it is the American administration. And there are good reasons, electoral reasons, for Biden to want to become more involved, because right now, he is in trouble in some of the uh, a key uh, states because of, first of all, where Michigan, where there is a, a concentration of Palestinian Americans and Lebanese, and also the younger, uh, more uh, left uh, progressive side of the Democratic Party. It's in Biden's interest to provide answers that will satisfy both the Israeli and the Palestinian needs. So 
that is what I think should be done. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually want to go back and expand a bit on this uh, issue of the refugees, which is also tied to uh, what Eli was talking about with ceasefires. So uh, Biden, as we know, he's not talking about ceasefires. He's talking about a humanitarian pause. Um, today, I heard that they actually would like this pause to be three days and that Netanyahu is very concerned about agreeing, not just Netanyahu, but the, the army here as well, because they're afraid that a three-day pause will give Hamas enough time to get their act together again, to regroup, and that um, it'll give the forces who are in favor of a permanent ceasefire the, in, in the international community, uh, or global public opinion enough time to uh, apply enough pressure that Israel won't be able to resume the fighting. Um, the other thing is that there's a lot of pressure here related to the refugees that how can we, I mean, the, the refugee families are extremely vocal as they should be. And I think the, the one issue that all of the Israeli public is united around is the need to release the refugees first. And the hostages. Uh, the, the hostages. Sorry, the yeah. hostages. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Um, this issue of all for all, uh, it's really the Israeli left <laughs> and the families of the hostages that are talking about it. Um, and former it chief of staff, really Shaul um, also. Yeah, but it hasn't, it's it's being discussed on the Israeli side. Hamas hasn't said that yet. And there's also talk that it may not be in Hamas's interest. Hamas may prefer to actually do things in stages of like releasing the women in exchange for uh, female prisoners and releasing the sick in exchange for sick prisoners and something like that. So the question is, um, and I'm, I'm going to, make it two part related to the refugees in the past i'm first going to ask eli and then i'll come back to you uh Hillel, with the question about israeli society but eli in relation to netanyahu yeah he probably can't continue to say no to biden but where is that going to leave him in terms of israeli public opinion and in terms of the military that feels that saying yes to a three-day pause could actually mean that the war stops here. So how yeah, absolutely, and again, yeah, absolutely, and I think this is where the the Netanyahu government or Netanyahu himself is kind of finding, you know, how difficult it is to navigate these very, very stormy waters. Uh, on the one hand, he doesn't want to come across as too pacifying, kind of appeasing, almost kind of Chamberlain kind of a thing. Um, and on the other hand, he understands the limits of power, given the fact that the Americans are not only providing the military aid, but providing the, the diplomatic coverage. For example, in the UN Security Council, they aborted or kind of threatened to veto a number of critical resolutions against Israel. They didn't mention, for example, the hostages or the October 7th or Hamas in general. So I think this is very complicated. And I think you're absolutely right, Susie. The military came out just uh, uh, earlier today and certainly from uh, in the past couple of days arguing that Nahum Barnea wrote about that uh, in the Adiota Chonot, the daily, the newspaper daily today, saying that the pause, as you know, everything in the Middle East, if there's something constant, is the fact that the, you know, the temporary is the most persistent. And so the, the concern here is that if you go to this three-day pause, it will kind of escalate itself into a week, into a, into a couple of weeks, a month, and so on and so forth. So from the from the military perspective, it's a it's a it's pretty much a zero sum game. You can do a couple of humanitarian pauses over a few hours. We saw that yesterday, for example, when the IDF tanks were literally um, overlooking the passage from north to south, where you have Palestinian uh, individuals and families carrying uh, white flags or white pieces of cloth, and they cross from from north to south. But beyond that, they have no no intention or no interest or no willingness to to accommodate this. Uh, this uh, ceasefire. Um, with regards to the hostages, certainly there's a military or operational dimension to it. There was one hostage that was released as a result of a military raid just at the beginning, kind of within a few days. 
Uh, but we didn't see that happening or materializing since. The Americans have been using all kinds of uh, military capabilities, including drones and intelligence officers who were advising the Israelis on how to try and identify and locate these individuals. But the problem is that it's not just Hamas that apparently have hostages under their control. It seems like very likely that there are families, Palestinian families or Palestinian individuals who have hostages of their own, not to mention Palestinian Islamic Jihad, PAJ. So this kind of fragmented landscape makes things more complicated. But before I turn to um, turn the stage to to Hillel, I think that there's a there's a notion in Israel, or there's there's kind of part of the public opinion in Israel does reflect this um, this idea that despite the need to have the hostages back home, especially the civilians, the the young children, the women, the elderly, those who are sick, and so on and so forth. I think that when you contrast that with the degree of trauma that the October seventh attack kind of constitutes, I think there's a willingness or more willingness of the Israeli general public um, to accept losses even there, not only soldiers going into the Gaza Strip, but also saying, you know, if we, if some hostages do not make it alive as a result of what we do, so be it, in a sense, the bigger picture uh, has precedent there. And given the nature of the Hamasi threat from, you know, in, in, in the eyes of the general public, um, this might be a, a price, quote unquote, that they are willing to pay. Um, this remains to be seen, obviously. Hamas didn't release, you know, not, not frequently at least, you know, huge numbers of videos trying to extract and use the presence of the hostages as leverages against the Israeli government. And the Qatari, uh, uh, Qatari uh, representatives and ambassadors are meeting with Israeli families of hostages around the world, one in London just recently in the United States as well. And so there's a lot of things happening uh, behind the scene. But from a military perspective, I think that the military wishes to continue as planned. Uh, from their perspective, they're doing it quite effectively, despite the um, approximately 30 Israeli soldiers who had died since the, uh, since the attack of October 7th. But according, you know, it seems like most indicators suggest this is a very um, I would say prudent, if you wish, uh, very you know, meticulous uh, implementation of a plan that is going as they envisioned it so far. It didn't backfire significantly. Okay, um, thank you very much, Hillel. I just I said I was going to come back to you on hostages. We're the time is going very quickly. Um, so just a, a one small aspect of the hostage thing, but it's something that uh, has come up a lot, is this issue of foreigners and people with dual citizenship. And so what it will mean, only yesterday there was news that Thailand actually had reached out to Iran of all people, and Iran was able to get picture showing that the foreign workers, the Thai foreign workers who were being held were in good condition. And so now Iran is involved in the hostage negotiations directly as opposed to through proxies. And uh, the United States is looking out for its people. And Canada has uh, a very well-known peace activist, Vivian Silver is being held. So Hilla, what's your take on what it would mean to sort of the fabric of Israeli society, if we see that foreign governments are able to get their citizens out when Israel is failing to secure the release of Israelis yeah. who don't carry a second passport. Well, the, the Israeli government, as I said earlier, has failed on all fronts. And this is just one other front. I must say, I haven't seen any poll which suggests that uh, any significant percentage of the Israeli public is ready to sacrifice the hostages in exchange for uh, military achievements in Gaza. That, I, I don't think, is a factor. And there is, it's very clear that, um, you know, everybody, as, as you said at the beginning, we all know people who either are hostages or were killed. And so it affects the entire Israeli society. Now, one thing, uh, of course, like you said at the beginning, 
uh, October 7th was a huge trauma for all of Israeli society. And one of the factors was, where was the army? The army, which we always have been told is the fourth or fifth strongest army in the world with uh, uh, supposedly 80 to 200 nuclear weapons, it wasn't there. And so there was this sense that um, we have to reestablish our deterrent capacity. And I think that what has happened in the past month has achieved that. We have demonstrated the tremendous power of the Israeli army. And so now it should be possible to find a formula which will enable not just, uh, we already had two Israeli citizens who were released. Uh, one of them, 85 year old, uh, a, I forget her name, Lifshitz, uh, uh, from kibbutz uh, near Oz, and uh, her husband, 83-year-old Oded Lifshitz, who was a very progressive journalist at uh, the Al Mishmar Daily, fighting for um, uh, Bedouin rights and Palestinian rights, is one of the people there. We we have a general situation. It hasn't been mentioned yet that um, most many of the hostages. Are, were on, are on the left. They were peace activists. The people who lived in those kibbutzim were peace activists. And uh, so this is something also where the question of how do we people who are peace activists ourselves and who are on the left, what do we feel about this? We feel, we know that Netanyahu had no concern for them. He even said, first of all, people should know that Netanyahu and most of the rest of the ministers have not visited the families of the victims and of the hostages and are afraid to do so because of the reaction that they would get if they came. Uh, who is the most popular person in Israel today? Joe Biden. He is considered <laughs> the savior. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to believe that, uh, you know, this, I, I know that he's losing points in the polls in the United States, but if uh, the 2024 elections were held here, he would win hands down. And uh, Lincoln also. I Just noticed. remember that a couple of years ago, we uh, built a new city named Trump. So. Yes, yes, yes. And <laughs> some people have already suggested to change it to uh, Biden city instead of Trump city. <laughs> So, okay, uh, I want to, uh, yeah. yeah, we need to move along here because I want to leave a bit of time for audience questions, but uh, I wanted to throw this one to you, Eli. Um, Israel has been pushing or trying to sell the idea that Hamas is ISIS. So to what extent do you think that that's a valid comparison? And also, um, do you think that there are grounds for what Netanyahu has been warning about, that if Israel doesn't defeat Hamas, it's going to land on the doorstep of countries in the Western world. Well, factually speaking, I think that some of the atrocities perpetrated by Hamas terrorists on October 7th are akin to, if not superseding, some of the things we've seen from ISIS and other offshots of that uh, horrible organization. Um, we're talking about shooting individuals. It's about the kidnapping. It's about the there's torture. There's uh, there's allegations of rape. There's there's you know uh, people were I just saw a report uh, earlier today saying that women were raped in front of their family members. Some of them were shot immediately thereafter. Uh, we heard horrible things about pregnant women. I don't want to go into the gory and horrible uh, details. Um, um, there's a 45 minute long. Um, video that the uh, IDF spokesperson had compiled that was screened um, uh, in the Knesset. It will be screened again, according to some reports. Uh, it was shared with international um, uh, opinion makers or influencers, including Hollywood, but also diplomats and so on and so forth. So I think it's it's, it's extremely, uh, the, the barbarism is is beyond, um, I think, to some extent, or to a large extent, what, what ISIS have perpetrated for a long time. Um, well, it depends on how you define the, the ability of Hamas to kind of to invade uh, 
or to do anything beyond the, the confines of the Gaza Strip. Certainly, it's it's part or of. Or does bigger... it want to? Would do but you I think, think they would want to work outside the region? Yeah, I think well, Hamas is, is slightly or significantly more um, uh, geographically limited in its scope. It's about certainly it's about um, uh, the covenant from 1988, kind of calls for the uh, annihilation of the state of Israel, uh, the eradication of Jews. But I think it's mostly limited to Israel itself. I don't think it's it's kind of has any global aspirations. However, um, I think you mentioned that in passing, Su uh, Susie, just earlier. Uh, Iran is part of this kind of uh, this axis of resistance. That is, it's a proxy of the Iranian regime, like like Hezbollah, like the Houthis uh, in Yemen. So it might kind of play a role in a bigger design, if and when um, the patrons back in Tehran perhaps will will find it fit. Um, the, it has a regional footprint, right? There's Hamas uh, presence in southern Lebanon, for example, cooperating with, working with uh, Hezbollah. There's um, there's regional actors working from from Syria and certainly uh, across the border in Sinai, perhaps. So uh, I don't see that escalating into a global uh, terrorism wave, but certainly it kind of tie it, it does tie both in terms of the ideology, uh, some of the um, some of the methodology, if you wish, horrible barbaric uh, violence can tie and kind of kind of resonates with that certainly. Okay, thanks a lot. Um... I want to get to some of our audience questions. I will pass up on some of mine because there's interesting stuff here. And if you guys can try to be brief, uh, Hillel, I think um, this one will be interesting for you. Uh, it says there are dozens of Israeli-Palestinian peace partnerships involving hundreds or thousands of Palestinian partners. They are tomorrow's Palestinian leaders. Why is everyone ignoring them and instead on is insisting negotiating with the existing power structure, in other words, the PA, which is not exactly uh, seen by most Palestinians as a legitimate leadership today. That's my own observation. Well, uh, first of all, of course, there's a basic difference between the Palestinian Israeli citizens and the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, it, Israel is not going to negotiate with its own citizens. It, in the final analysis, we need to negotiate with a Palestinian partner. Hamas cannot be that Palestinian partner. The only alternative is the PLO, the Palestinian Authority, which should have elections and have new leadership. And one of the calls is to release Marwan Barghouti, who is in prison and who could, in theory, uh, play the role of a Palestinian Nelson Mandela if he were released and if he were elected. So we do have some wonderful internal Israeli Jewish Palestinian uh, joint activity, particularly the Standing Together movement, which is a young movement of grassroots activists working together. Uh, as a sports fan, I was particularly impressed to read a, a whole article in Yudhiyota Honot about Salim Tuama, who is uh, a, a hero of Hapoel Tel Aviv, the so-called left-wing uh, soccer club. In, and he has been going around received by uh, the wounded. And even people on the right are saying, we so appreciate the fact that you're coming to see us. And we uh, apologize for the fact that we called you a terrorist. And yeah. we now, in other words, yes. But, but I think the focus here isn't on uh, Palestinian Israelis. They're asking about about the, Palestine. Uh, okay, so we need in the occupied need, territories. Yes. Okay. So if we're talking about the occupied territories, obviously no possibility of negotiations with Hamas. Hamas has to be out of the picture. And so we get back to the Fatah, Palestinian, the PLO, uh, and people should know, by the way, that Hamas is not a member of the PLO. And uh, what we need is a rejuvenation on the Palestinian side and what the Palestinians are calling for as well, because there's a whole generation of Palestinians who have never voted an election. And Abbas has lost uh, the confidence of the people. And so if we're going to have an address 
for future negotiations, we need two changes. We need a rejuvenated PLO, Palestinian Authority, with new elections. And we also need a different Israeli government, obviously, because this current government with Netanyahu as its leader, with Smotrich and with Ben Gvir, is also not an address for negotiations. So we need change in both sides. And one of the things that happens when you have a crisis like this is crisis create new opportunities for change, for change of policy, and also for change of leadership. And so hopefully, we in Israel, when the war ends, will be able to have a new government. And hopefully, the Palestinians in the West Bank will also be able to uh, revive and rejuvenate. And then we in the longer run, and hopefully shorter than longer, would be able to eventually revive negotiations. Okay, thanks, uh, Hillel. Uh, now I'm going to make life hard for Eli because, Hillel, you were saying that it's just, you know, we're all operating the, on the assumption that Hamas is no longer considered legitimate and they won't be part of this process. And now we have an audience member who's kind of challenging that and is asking, first of all, the whether the Bush administration shouldn't have allowed them to take part in the elections in 2005. And when they did win, whether it was wrong not to recognize them. And we have something related to that. Another question, which is that if if today the people of Gaza, if Hamas is who they choose as their leadership and they were elected through a democratic process, who are we to decide that they're not a legitimate power? So Eli, I'll let you take that one. And I think- Thank you so much. Maybe we'll have time yes. for one more, I'm not sure. Thank you so much. Indeed, a very complicated and difficult question to answer. One is, I think that Hamas has significant popularity both in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, certainly amidst the weakness, if you like, or the corruption of the Palestinian Authority. So. You know, hindsight is always 2020, and it's difficult to say, you know, what would have happened in 2005 if Israel had pulled out rather than unilaterally um, kind of created this mechanism with the Palestinian Authority, or what, ha what would have happened if Israel had released um, prisoners as part of a negotiation with the Palestinian Authority rather than as part or in response to the kidnapping of Gilad Shalit at the time, where a thousand prisoners were released, including Ichi Sanwa, who's currently the head of Hamas in the Gaza Strip. So uh, kind of what ifs are awesome. I like it. I'm an academic, so I, I welcome the intellectual uh, <laughs> challenge there. Um, I, I'd like to kind of to quote, and this is a wonderful quote that I always kind of tell my students, and it goes as follows. The pessimist complains about the wind. The optimist expected to change. The realist adjusts the sales. This is William Arthur Ward. And I think we need to be realist, you know, albeit this is a progressive setting for you folks, but we got to be realist at the same time. And I think that we can kind of combine the two and have um, prices is always an opportunity, as Hillel said, to get some new ideas, some new opportunities. And I think there's a concept that I like. I teach a class on political psychology especially in protracted conflicts, and the concept is ripeness. This idea that we, both parties to the conflict, feel that it's enough is enough. Uh, we are done, kind of a post-World War II era, kind of a, an environment in Western Europe where we had both the French and the Germans cooperating, creating the European community, uh, later on becoming the European Union. So it can go this, this way, kind of in a very positive you know, way, um, where people kind of reckon, they kind of self-reflect, and try to kind of try to change and adjust the, the fundamental basics, basic uh, facts on the ground and try to see things differently. On the other hand, and this is also a possibility, and this is where the realism comes into play, is the fact that Israeli public opinion, once again, will be much more hardlined, less, less optimistic, less hopeful, feeling more helpless, uh, more besieged, if you wish. And as a result of that, their ability to communicate and to engage the Palestinians, whether these is, we're talking about the PA now under uh, Mahmoud, uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas or um, uh, Abu Mazen or somebody else instead. Um, so we can, it can go both ways. It depends on the situation on the ground, how it unfolds, the hostages issue, 
uh, the day after with regards to whether Hamas is extracted from the Gaza Strip or not. Um, too many moving parts to know. But again, I'm, I'm partly an optimist, but we got to keep, you know, our realism also as a check on that optimism, nevertheless. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, I think we have time for one more, which uh, I think I'll take by myself because it refers to what I said about the tight siege on Gaza that existed before October 7th. And it mentions that actually, actually Israel had given permits to Gaza workers to cross the border. Um, they were allowed to come in and, and, and work, just not bring weapons with them. And maybe it wasn't, maybe actually we weren't strict enough. Maybe we shouldn't have allowed concrete into Gaza, which we were giving in order for them to do reconstruction. And Hamas ended up building hostages, uh, sorry, not tunnels with it. Um, so my response to that is that, and I've written several articles about this, it's, it's really important to distinguish between Hamas and the people of Gaza. Uh, Hamas doesn't, isn't only holding Israelis hostage now, Hamas has been holding over 2 million people, close to 2.5 million people in Gaza hostage for a long time. Uh, it steals from them. It, it, the money that it was getting to help the Gaza population to rebuild Gaza did take for its own purposes and to build or to buy weapons and to build tunnels and all of that. But two and a half million people aren't responsible for that. And the more we tighten the squeeze on them, the less options we gave them, the hungrier they got, the poorer they got, the less educated they got, the more people they saw dying around them. And I don't know why I'm speaking in past tense because it's exactly what, not the only reason, but let's say very, leaving aside the moral issue from a, or moral issue from a pragmatic point of view, why we shouldn't be carpet bombing Gaza now is that Israel's actions help create a desperate population. I'm not saying Israel created Hamas, do not misunderstand me. That is not what I'm saying, okay? I'm saying set Hamas aside for a moment and consider there is a civilian population there. They don't all support Hamas. They can't, uh, the president of Israel said, why didn't they rise up against Hamas? because they're taking their lives in their hands if they do that, okay? It's not exactly a free society where you can say whatever you want. So I don't believe that strangling people into a point of desperation where they have nothing to lose is going to contribute to, I won't say jolly peaceful relations in the Middle East, but I do see a future in which we can live side by side without killing each other. And frankly, that's good enough for me. So on that note, we're gonna draw things to an end. Um, and but Tal will be- One, one yes, brief sure, Hillel, basic go ahead. comment. Sure. That I don't believe that we Israelis and Palestinians can do it on our own. We can't arrive at a solution we need international third party involvement. We need the type of American involvement that Eisenhower did in 1956 when he demanded that Israel withdraw from Sinai, the type of presidential involvement that Jimmy Carter demonstrated in the Israeli-Egyptian mm -hmm. peace process. And we should also mention the EU has a tremendous interest in not having the crisis continue and then having a mass overflow of refugees from the Middle East coming to Europe, creating more destabilization. And the same is true for the members of the Arab League with the Arab Peace Initiative, which should be the basis for any future solution, resolution of the conflict. Right. Thanks, Hillel. And um, thank you both for a very interesting discussion. Thanks every, to everyone who tuned in. Um, I'm going to add on to what Hillel said, because 
I think the only thing that we know for sure is that we can't know anything for sure. But in addition to all the organizations that Hill mentioned, uh, I want to come back to the question of civil society. And I think the one thing that we do know for sure is that civil society has a very important role to play. And so we want to thank PPI for letting us speak to you. We want to thank all of you who listened. I want to apologize to those who <laughs> sent us really good questions and I wasn't able to get to them. Um, but our panelists really had very interesting things to say to us. And I'm sure that this isn't the last time that we'll be discussing this issue. So please join us again. Thank you. Me too. Thanks. Thank you so much, Susie. Um, you gave me a perfect segue. Thank you so much. Um, because what I wanted to say is that when it comes to these civil society organizations that our panelists spoke about today, we are continuing to hear from them as a part of our fourth annual digital Israel-Palestine symposium. We have upcoming sessions on November 19th and December 3rd. To learn more and register for that symposium, uh, please do visit progressiveisrael.org. And once again, I do just really want to extend my, my deepest thank yous to Dr. Eli Saltzman, to Hillel Schenker, and to our incredible moderator, Susie Becher, and thank you to everyone who joined us. I also want to give a thank you to my colleague, Ron Skolnick, who um, did a ton of behind the scenes work here and made this discussion happen today. Again, we appreciate your support. We hope to continue to see you at our symposium, at upcoming webinars, and we would encourage you again to make a donation to Partners for Progressive Israel at progressiveisrael.org. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Okay.